important. Hi. Hi. <laughs> okay. okay, thanks. Jill, do you want to introduce the, uh, the work session agenda item? So the first thing we've got on our agenda this morning is our MS4 on um, public hearing. We've got uh, Sabrina Charney Hall, our director of planning, and we've got Bob Scioli, um, our town engineer, who will go through our annual uh, stormwater report. Sabrina, Bob, welcome. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Um, each year, uh, we are required to submit a report to New York State DEC to uh, document our compliance with the municipal separate storm sewer system permit that we operate under each year. So this annual presentation, many of you have seen it in different formats over the years. We're here to present the work that we've done um, over the past year. So I'm gonna share my screen um, in a moment because we have a little PowerPoint presentation for you. Oh, I am disabled. Carrie, can you allow me to square to share my screen? All set. Thank you. Let me see if I can get this to be a presentation mode. Okay, so the reporting period uh, for our annual stormwater report this year is March 10th, 2020 through March 9th, 2021. Um, right now we're working under a, a, a stormwater permit, which was effective May 1st, 2015 through April 30th, 2020. Last year, there was uh, movement and discussion on a revised permit um, prior to the expiration date. Um, we have not yet received a renewed permit. It's still under develop, which is why there's a, qu a question mark um, by the date of expiration. We're operating under the continuation of GP15-003. This is just a detail. Um, the changes, there will be changes in a revised permit, but they have not yet been solidified. Just to kind of back it out a little bit. What is stormwater? So it's exactly what it sound like, sounds like. It's water from a storm. And so basically when it rains, water hits the ground. There are areas where there's nothing blocking that water from sinking into the ground. Um, and there's areas where you have pavement or you have buildings, sidewalks, which prevent the water from going into the ground. Oftentimes when the, the storm water that hits what we call the impervious surface, the roads, the parking lots, driveways, buildings. A lot of times it can run off the, the hard surfaces, disturb the soft surfaces, the, erode, the, the ground, and pick up and, and start eroding and pick up sedimentation on its way. And then all of that water goes into the lowest point or typically our streams and our water bodies. So this program is to regulate the quantity and most importantly quality of the stormwater that occurs out in our community and every other community in New York State. So just to give you a lay of the land, this is Newcastle's hydrology. So if you look at this blue line, the blue lines on here, these are the major drainage divides. If you look a little cl more closely, you'll see faint orange lines. Those are considered minor drainage basins. What this is, is when you when the rain falls, if it falls near the edge of a blue line, it's going to drain in that area. Okay, it'll go to the lowest point in that area. Newcastle is located within four watershed basins. One of our largest and most um, regulated is the Croton River Basin. That's New York City's watershed. We also have land area in the lower Hudson River Basin, also known as the Pocantico and the Sawmill River Basins. Those are sub watersheds of the lower Hudson River Basin. We are also 
partly within the Bronx River Basin, which drains into the Kensico Reservoir, another water body controlled by the New York City Department of Environmental Protection. We also have some land area towards the eastern side of town in the upper Long Island Sound Basin. Okay, so each one of these basins has different regulations. For example, the Croton watershed is known as phosphorus restricted. There is something called a total maximum daily load calculation that has been promulgated by New York State that says there are thresholds as to how much phosphorus this water body can take. So all of the, um, the projects, construction projects, town projects, everything that we do, we need to try and reduce the amount of phosphorus that's going into the water bodies in the Croton watershed. The upper Long Island Sound is not phosphorus restricted, it's nitrogen restricted. Okay, so there's different practices and protocols to try and reduce nitrogen within the drainage basins of the upper Long Island Sound. We also have water bodies that are listed on a state list. It's called the state priority water body list. Those water bodies are listed due to the, the incidence of pathogens, metals, and other nutrients, including phosphorus and nitrogen, nitrogen in the water body. There's also a 303D list, which is kept by New York State DEC, which also lists water bodies. Two water bodies that flow through our town, the salt, or that we drain into, the Sawmill River and the Bronx River, are on the, on the 303D list. And this listing gives indication that projects that drain to these water bodies have to undertake certain other water quality best management practices to try and reduce the impacts of certain nutrients into those water bodies. When we talk about stormwater management under this general permit, there's six categories. They're called minimum control measures. This slide identifies each of those six categories. And per this presentation, Bob and I will be going through each minimum control measure. Public education and outreach, public participation and involvement, illicit discharge detection and elimination, construction site runoff, post-construction runoff control, and pollution prevention good housekeeping. And so each year we undertake activities in each of these minimum control measures. When I say we, it's many different departments in town government, okay? It's the development office, it's the Department of Public Works, it's the Parks Department, every office that has an element of working out in the town, in the field, has an impact on our annual reporting activity. The town clerk's office is also involved. So it, it kind of runs through everybody um, in town, in the town hall or in town government. When we talk about public education and outreach, on this slide, you'll see our target audiences. We're not only targeting the community and people who work, live, and play in our community, we are also targeting people, public employees. We're targeting landscape contractors, board and committee members. These are all part of our audiences for public outreach and education. On the right hand side of the slide, you'll see all the topics that we educate about. Okay, construction site and how to manage a construction site for stormwater management, we do on literally a daily basis. Vehicle washing, whether it is in the town DPW's washing facility or it's washing your car on your lawn. We provide information on how best to reduce the impacts of that activity on water quality. And I'm not gonna go through every one of these, you can all read them. This information will be posted on the website so those who, who are interested in going into detail can see it. 
So during the reporting period, we are required to identify which activities we have undertaken. So we implement strategies each reporting cycle. We have the direct mailing that we conduct, the annual water mailing. There are 5,670 people on that mailing list. We have public events and presentation, over 2,000 of them, where we talk about stormwater related issues. We have ongoing cable access programming where we replay the public events and presentations. We print materials, the water report was printed, and we undertake daily inspections. Materials are available in town hall, at the library. We have some on our town park kiosks. They're at the Department of Public Works and they're on our town website. How do we evaluate that we're doing a good job? So basically, when we look at the number of applications that come into the development department, into building, that go to the planning board, that go to the zoning board, the architectural review board, the number of applications that have the low impact development or better site design elements for stormwater quality is increasing. We rarely see an application that doesn't have a component of water quality protection to them. We know that we're mailing information pamphlets and brochures. We have them for people to pick up information and we know our website is being visited. In the past, we've actually run programs where we've had people send us back flyers with and fill out a fact from information that we've put out there and we run contests. We have we did not do that during the reporting pe pe uh, period of 2020 to 2021 due to COVID, but that is something that we try and do. And this is when we talk about public participation and involvement, minimum measure two, we look to create strategies where we can get the community involved. Each year we hold a cleanup event. We have community hotlines if people see things that are going on in the community. We, we say that here's a number you can call. The community meetings, 350 attendees. We know just by the sheer volume of participation during the discussions of the form-based code where we discussed stormwater management, we had much more than 350 attendees. We also post this annual report on the website. We're talking about it today and it'll this meeting will replay on the cable access channel. So how do we know we're impacting the public? Again, the discussion of the stormwater related issues at our public meetings and during the public hearing process continues to increase. The townwide mailing, um, you know, it goes to people's doors, they read it. And we have a questionnaire on the website that people can access and fill out. And we actually still have people filling out that questionnaire. Minimum control measure three, illicit discharge detection and elimination. So this is when something isn't quite right that's occurring out in our community in relation to water quality. So in the town, the infrastructure to support this minimum control measure relates to outfalls. We have 313 outfalls. An outfall is an end of pipe. That's where the pipe ends and enters into the stream, the lake, or the water body. We, no, no, uh, there was not one outfall that was verified um, during COVID, right? Typically we inspect all of these outfalls. We make sure that there's clean water running out of them if they are even running uh, water. Um, due to COVID, we were not out there doing that in this past re reporting year. Building maintenance, commercial car washes, parking lots, uh, outdoor fluid storage, uh, vehicle maintenance repair shop. These are all targets for IDDE inspection. And then this, during this reporting period, there were two illicit discharges that were detected. When it comes to looking at strategies to implement this minimum control measure, we do storm sewer shed mapping, which is how we know there are 313 outfalls. This information is available on our geographic information system.
And this during this reporting period, 33% of relevant of staff in relevant positions and departments had received some form of IDDE training. This next slide, I'm going to turn over to Mr. Scioli. Um, when it comes to evaluating and measuring our progress. Um, Bob, do you want to talk about this or do you want to hold off? I'd like to say a few words. Okay. Uh, thank you, Sabrina. Thank you so much. I must say that I have to tell everyone, Sabrina is a tough act to follow. Um, I'm going to try my best to emulate how she is. Uh, hopefully I'll do half as good as her. As her. Uh, anyway, with that being said, uh, we had two illegal discharges in our town uh, during this reporting period. They were uh, septic failures. Uh, and a lot of them we get tipped off by residents in town uh, with odors, obviously. So what we do is we do an inspection. We go out there to take a look at it. As soon as we go out there, we can pretty much tell it's a problem with septic. We contact the Westchester County Department of Health. They have their own inspectors go out there. They do their own testing. Uh, in these two particular cases, they were found to be obviously E. coli, and they sent a notice of violation that is the county so then they try to come in and then they come into the town and they get a fill in and granting permit. And these two illegal discharges were successfully found and cured during this reporting period. Next slide, Ms. Sabrina. Sure. Um, next is the minimum control measure number four. This particular control measure has everything to do with construction. I get involved with the construction end of it, four and five. Uh, construction site runoff control. Basically, when anyone comes in for a stormwater permit that needs a stormwater permit, and based on Chapter 108A, basically, excuse me for a second. That was the phone. Basically, uh, they come in and they have to fill out and prepare what's known as a erosion and sedimentation control plan. Uh, basically, these plans are all based on prescriptive measures that are all developed, vetted out, and directed and required by New York State DEC Blue Book. Uh, so everything that comes in, albeit a small project for a pool or a major subdivision or a major commercial development, must meet this type of regulation. And just to read what's on here, uh, the owners are required to submit stormwater pollution prevention plans. They're called a SWIP, obviously, in accordance with DEC Stormwater Management Design Manual. In accordance with the blue book, I always say this all the time, I don't believe the book's blue, but they call it anyway. Uh, the engineering division performs routine site inspections as well to make certain not only, it's always nice to have the plans look good and approved, but the second approach to this is you have to make certain when they're doing it during construction, you have boots on the ground and everyone looks at it. Basically, they require the applicant to have their own consultant look at it. And in addition to that, we are required based in tasks by DEC since 2007 to make certain we keep our own records as well to make certain the consultant and the applicant who's doing the work is all in accordance with the DEC. Um, next slide, Sabrina. Yep. Uh, basically, these are the strategies implemented. Uh, we have the SWIP inspection review procedures are in place. These are pretty much guidelines that again, are pretty much developed and vetted by DEC. We pretty much do what they want. We have to as a town, as an MS4. And during this reporting period, we had 14 SWIPs reviewed during the reporting period. And then the procedures to receive public comments are in place as well as Sabrina stated previously so articulately. Next slide, please. Um, this is basically minimum control measure number five. Now, what this pertains to is once you have it constructed, uh, it doesn't end there. You have to make certain when it is constructed that it's being maintained, uh, albeit on a very small site uh, where the homeowners are responsible for, or the major subdivisions, Mavis, Brandywine subdivision, uh, and even the major retail developments such as Chapel Court Crossing. So what we do and what the planning board does and what the zoning board does at this level, as Sabrina mentioned before, is we make certain that they do come in and have plans to show clearly how it will be maintained. And the way we do this is basically by making certain they do prepare and provide maintenance guarantees by bonding. And not only that, make certain they have actual agreements which are reviewed by town council and myself. And then they are required to be filed, signed. Many of them are signed by the supervisor, approved by the board. 
And then not only that, we make certain they are filed down in county. Next slide, please, Sabrina. Uh, this is basically a typical example. This is the Brandywine subdivision located off of Brandon Drive due to the extent of this uh, subdivision, which was built out many years ago. This was a two-tiered approach because not only does it have to meet the DEC standards and chapter 108A, which is a local law, which was based on DEC type of uh, modeling, this must also go before the New York City DEP as well, because as Sabrina stated earlier, this is in the Croton watershed. So not only does it looked at by DEC, the town, it looks at by DEP as well. And it's a very strenuous and rigorous set of plans that must be developed by them. And these are two basins that were put in and you can see they turn out quite nicely. These are called extended detention basins. Not only do they treat the water quality, which is very critical, uh, they treat the flooding as well. And all of these are designed and maintained to make certain that they can hold up to pre and post development of a hundred year storm, which has been upgraded to 9.23 inches during a 24 hour period. So they're pretty huge uh, types of uh, structures that are built in. Not only that, when these things are built out, I make certain that the contractor provides an as-built that shows all the topography. And that always assures us that it's built according to plan. And what I do on the major subdivisions is make certain that they do provide modeling based on the as-built condition. So it's functioning as originally designed and approved by DEP, the planning board and DEC. Next slide, please. Yeah, I, let me just add, add a, a point of clarification. So, you know, Bob is talking about as builds, what's there. The This picture reflects stormwater detention basins, which are sized according to the amount of planned development in that subdivision, right? If, if somebody was to say, we want to add three more houses, in that subdivision, these basins would have to be redesigned to handle the additional runoff from those extra three houses. So I think that's important for folks to understand that this is a planned detention basin based on the amount of development that is going to occur. Sorry right. about that, Bob. Good point, no, that's fine. No, this particular subdivision, as everyone knows, it originally started out as 40, which yours truly worked on in 1981 as a consultant, downsized it to eight. So uh, this was a full build out of all the eight lots. Now keep in mind, I guess everyone knows that uh, certain lots to the north were developed and one it's gonna be, I guess, conservation. So really there'll be less runoff into these things. But at that point in time, we didn't know that, but this was for a full build out of all the late eight lots in this subdivision, particular subdivision. So, uh, but thank you, can I ask a, just a technical question about these basins? Maybe it's not that technical, but um, are they are they in place like in the lowest spot so there's just pass off, passive runoff of stormwater to these basins or or is runoff from constructed properties directed to them like gutters etc. Absolutely, this whole system is predicated upon picking up everything that's being developed in the site, not just passive, but every house has roof leaders, which goes into a closed conveyance system system through catch basins and everything from the development, which is all new and pervious and everything regraded from changing the curve numbers goes into these systems. So it picks up everything on the whole subdivision and the way the lay of the land was with this particular subdivision, it had to be broken up into two basins, one on the north, which is just north of Cynthia Court, which is just east of Brandon and the southerly one, which is all the way down on the south part of lot eight which picks up everything and anything. So it's not just passive, it's everything. Uh, because the last thing we want in any of these developments is any type of downstream detriment to any type of streams with flooding, which is my main concern. And of course, water quality, which is a big aspect of DEC and DEP. So hopefully that answers your question. It does. But, 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 but also I think it's important to note the flow into these systems is more often than not what's considered gravity flow. There's no, there's, we, we don't like to use pumps systems to, for stormwater to get the stormwater somewhere. Oh, so never. we're at, they're at the lowest point within what's called the drainage basin. And Absolutely. so when Bob's talking about north and south, he's talking about drainage basins and the bottom of those drainage basins that can catch all of the water. Right. 
Right. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, these are all gravity. You would DEP, DEC doesn't have anything in their books and they would not allow anything having to do with a pumping system. It would be too catastrophic if you had a big storm event. Because let's be honest, when you have the big storm events, you have the winds, you have this. And if the pumping system were to fail, it'd be catastrophic downstream problems. They would never allow that. So everything is by gravity and that is it. Okay. And then, and then um, not every, but not every neighborhood in Newcastle was planned like this. No. <laughs> no, this is only for the major subdivisions. We have a cutoff point in town for the homeowners when they come in, basically based on chapter 108A. Any new net and previous area of a thousand square feet requires post storm water. So if you have something that's 700, 800 square feet, it's not that onerous to the uh, people that live in town, obviously. We also have older subdivisions that predated DEC's regulations. And that's why at the beginning, I kind of looked at that 2015, because five years before that, there was a permit, but five years before that, there wasn't. So, um, you know, this is relatively new in regards to development. And also, too, the DEC, along with NOAA, are developing more intense rainstorm events, as everyone knows, with climate change. We're getting much more water when it's getting much more intense storms. And one of the key items that DEC and DEP is going to make this new manual change, as Sabrina mentioned at the beginning of this presentation, is they're going to make it much more rigorous in the modeling to show that there's going to be much more water coming from these storms, which is going to make more development, have more money to spend on these types of basins. So it's going to increase the amount of retention that's going to need by each subdivision. So that's a critical component of the new regulations once they come out. Next slide, please. Um, these are basically the strategies implemented. We had four active construction projects disturbing one acre more. Those are the big subdivisions, Brandywine, Chapel Crossing, for example. Uh, all active construction sites are routinely inspected by the end of engineering division and the consultants. That's required by DEC. Uh, and all inspections performed in compliance to make certain they there are by the standards because again you could have the best plan in the world but if you don't have the proper people inspecting it that know what they're looking at with the consultant and the town uh, it doesn't mean anything because you, you will have no idea how they're built that's why i'm a stickler on getting as built on this because you'd be surprised how many times the basins are never built as designed so once we get an as built they have to redo it two or three times so i guess practice makes perfect uh, owners are required to submit legal agreements, as I stated before, on the bigger subdivisions, commercial developments. Uh, we have standard stormwater agreements that are very rigorous, making certain that the homeowners, not the homeowners, but basically the commercial developments are responsible for these in perpetuity. If they don't, the town has the right to go out there, demand inspection reports, and they can also have things done to them. And I think it's a lien against the property. So we have all the bases covered on all of these agreements for the bigger developments, i.e. big subdivisions and commercial developments. <clears throat> Again, all agreements are approved by the planning board. Thank oh, you, Sabrina. Sorry, Bob. Oh, that's okay. Uh, all agreements are approved by the town board and they're filed in the county because once they're filed in the county, that's proof in the pudding that they were enforceable. Uh, if they're just signed and not filed, it doesn't mean too much because once they're filed in the county, they're picked up on all previous homeowners and all previous transactions legal. Thank you, Sabrina. <clears throat> uh, minimum control measure, evaluating the measures in progress. All construction projects are required to submit SWIPs, obviously. Uh, they continue to show more consistency. And again, like I said before, once this new New York State Design Stormwater Manual comes out, uh, it's gonna be probably much more stringent than the previous one. And we will no doubt enforce that based on what the applicants have to submit and what we review as well. Uh, stormwater map, okay. Uh, Post-construction runoff control strategies implemented. We had three post-construction stormwater management practices. That applies, <clears throat> not only do we make certain that the <laughs> commercial development do it in homeowners, we adhere to as a town. So we have three post-construction management practices. We have one, believe it or not, in the parking lot, south parking lot, <clears throat> which is a sand filter, which picks up all of the tributary area in that area in the south and cleans out the water quality before it goes into the uh, headwaters of the Sawmill River. And we have two other hydrodynamic separators. One was put in years ago when we put the new parking lot in behind, behind the Bank of America, uh, which is north of Woodburn. 
and we just put one in behind Citibank, which was in part and parcel to the Chappaqua Hamlin Improvement Project. So we do make certain that town projects adhere to the same standards that we make the applicants do in town. Uh, 100 cash basins were inspected and 80 maintained by TPW. Uh, we keep Excel spreadsheets and all the uh, post-construction BMTs. Terry does that in our office. And of course, the local laws we use that we just talked about are 108A, which is stormwater and erosion and sediment control, and 108B, which is illegal discharges and illicit connections. Uh, obviously, these are all looked at quite intently by the planning board, zoning board, and I would imagine to the town board as well. Uh, and we follow all the procedures and codes in the building codes. And those are the two codes that have been adopted since uh, April 2007. Next slide, Sabrina. Sure. Now, now this, this is going to turn us over to Sabrina. Now, this is her gig. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> My gig. So when it comes to post-construction stormwater management, we also are under what's considered umbrella compliance with our neighbors in the New York City watershed. So all of the municipalities that make up the New York City watershed, both in Westchester and Putnam County, are working together as a on a coordinated approach called umbrella compliance to implement strategies to uh, retrofit what's out there today. So Lori, you had asked a question about what about older subdivisions? It's not every property has this. Well, the East of Hudson Watershed Corporation, which is made up of all of the municipalities in Putnam and Westchester's New York City watershed area, work together to identify projects to obtain credit. So we are members of this umbrella compliance. We have um, a goal to meet uh, under umbrella compliance of a certain amount of phosphorus reduction through the retrofit program. So we are a member of what's called QUIC, the croton Kensical Watershed Intermunicipal Committee who have formed the East of Hudson Watershed Corporation. Every five years, the East of Hudson Watershed Corporation develops a five-year regional stormwater retrofit program that is approved by New York State DEC. Right now, we are in the second five-year period, soon to be in the third five-year period. You, on this slide, you see how many projects have been active in design and construction during the, the timeframes of umbrella compliance. In years one through five, we received, we, we looked at a reduction of what's called 534.33 kilograms per year of phosphorus. DEC has currently awarded the East of Hudson Watershed Corporation with 508.62 kilograms of phosphorus per year. In years six through 10, we are looking at a reduction of 524.72 kilograms per year. The current DEC credit, and, and it's current because some projects have yet to come to um, completion. We are looking at 16.10 kilograms of phosphorus per year. In this umbrella compliance, the town of Newcastle has five projects. We have Burden Preserve, we have two projects, I'm sorry, in Burden Preserve. We have a project along Sheather Road. We have pro a project up at Chapelco Crossing, and we have a project involving Courtmel Road. Each of these projects puts a, a kilogram phosphorus reduction towards Newcastle's minimum requirement. And I think our minimum requirement is, I wanna say around 50. Um, and so locating these projects in our town will give us a credit when it comes to operation and maintenance under umbrella compliance. If we do not have a project, and to date, none of these five projects have been constructed, we are obligated to contribute to operation and maintenance for the projects in under 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 umbrella compliance in other municipalities that are helping us meet our phosphorus reduction requirements. 
Another area of the stormwater management program is our municipal operations. Um, much of this is handled by the Department of Public Works, and it really comes into play when we're looking at things like street maintenance. We have bridges that we maintain, how we undertake winter road maintenance, snow and ice, salt storage, um, solid waste management. M you know, when we do projects, municipal construction and land disturbance, when we undertake planting projects, um, right-of-way maintenance, parks and open spaces, the, the list goes on and on and on. But everything we do in the active um, aspects of town government impact stormwater. During the reporting period, we swept 13 acres of parking lots. We also swept 62 miles of streets. We inspected 100 and cleaned 80 of our catch basins. We inspected and cleaned the three post-construction control practices. We applied approximately 1,500 pounds of nitrogen through fertilizer on in parks and open spaces. And 25% of municipal employees who needed training received it. And again, when it came to the training of employees and the actual field work, our numbers are a little bit less than our last reporting period due to COVID. And we weren't out there um, in as much force as we were for the length of time last year as we were previously. Evaluating and measuring progress. So our reporting procedures for the municipal departments that are for good housekeeping or our municipal operations are continually being reviewed to ensure that we're reporting on our town facilities and maintaining our and maintaining um, our and our maintenance activities. So again, we're doing the work. We now need to make sure we have the reports so we can document the credit for it. So we're working to retrofit our record keeping and reporting procedures, and we're trying to very ver verify our infrastructure. During last the last reporting process and this reporting process, we have been moving towards handheld device um, monitoring. So, you know, for example, DPW, when they're out doing a project, if there's a catch basin, they can pick up their phones and log into the town's data to identify, yes, there's a problem here, or we inspected it and it's fine. So trying to refine our processes where we can be on the go and updating our information live. And we're making a great headway thanks to Bart Carey and Kellen Cantrell working together to train um, the folks who are actually in the field and how to use the equipment. So it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty amazing to watch. Um, when we look at other things that we do, addition, they're called additional watershed improvement strategies. So we have an education program in, pra in place to address phosphor phosphorus and nitrogen. We have mapped 100% of our conveyance system. And we and we've mapped additional features. And so, Lori, you were asking, you know, kind of where is this? Is it in older neighborhoods? They have roads and they have catch basins, but they may not have pipes that we have mapped in newer sub or newer areas of town. Um, we are tracking on-site wastewater treatment systems that have been inspected. You know, trying to work with Westchester County to to understand who is maintaining their septic system, who isn't. We have a post-construction place that Bob and I have gone through. And, uh, you know, we're in our second year, five-year permit looking for projects. So if somebody has um, an erosion problem near a stream, call us, let us know. Maybe there's a project there that we can help retrofit. And that kind of carries you to the end. Um, you know, you can call our office. Uh, we serve as a hotline. Um, there's information on our website. We're always here to answer questions. And there's a host of information on the town's website. So Bob and I are here, happy to answer any questions that you, anyone might have. And that's about it. I have two questions. Sure. Um, which maybe will lead to more, but, um, let, let me, let me stop sharing so that everyone can see everyone. 
So, um, so my first question is just about the town use of fertilizer. Like, what are we fertilizing? Um, and how do we, you know, our, what direction is that headed in? And I'm just kind of wondering if we've gotten, you know, ideas from let's say the conservation board on how to reduce our use of fertilizer. As a, as a so our, the fertilizer that we use is phosphorus free. Okay, because the parks that we're using it are in are in the New York City watershed and there's no phosphorus in those fertilizers. The 1500 pounds is um, used to maintain, you know, grasses and whatnot. I would, I don't feel qualified to answer kind of the management of that. That would come from Ike Cusio, um, who's the superintendent of parks. But we, um, most of our use of fertilizers has been based on testing and what the soil needs to make sure that, you know, it is in good condition, grass is growing and we don't end up in, a, in an erosive situation. Got it, thank you. The other one is a, is a shift of topic and that is um, the management of water in Newcastle is a challenge for so many of our homeowners. Um, not only management of stormwater, but management of, of underground water and basement water. <laughs> um, I know, firsthand. Um, and so, so I was wondering, um, you know, what are resources that our residents can look to for some advice on how to handle this? Because um, you know, if there's a stream that ro runs literally through your house, it's a never ending source of water that you have to manage and, and in many cases, little, little place to put it. I mean, a lot of people call us up on those issues with that, uh, Lori. And the groundwater is a very, very complicated, complex thing to track and figure out where it's really coming from. That's hydrogeology. That really is not the study of hydrology, which is stormwater runoff, which is a little bit more black and white. Uh, but we always try to tell people, you know, groundwater is very, very tough to predict. It's you never know when it's going to raise lower, depending on the situation, on the climatic conditions, on the type of freeze thaw conditions you have. Very, very many, many, many variables involved. Uh, we always try to tell them to do what they can to pick it up in their basement with a sump pump. And what we tell them all the time, if they can, we'll help them out and try to direct it into a closed drainage system. Because a lot of times we don't want people just to put in a sump pump and just have it directed towards their neighbor's property, which is always not a good thing to do. So, you know, that's the only way we can help them out is to have them get a street opening permit to tie it into the closed drainage system if one is in the front. If not, we usually try to have it go to daylight, you know, so many feet away from the property line. Um, and that's, that's fine because that obviously is not considered an illicit discharge or an illegal discharge. It's just clean groundwater. So that's always not an issue for the town and the commissioner to allow to be tied into the town drainage system. That's the only avenue of help that I give most of the people that call me up with groundwater issues. So, so, so Lori, the, the New York State DEC is regulating surface impacts. Um, as Bob said, hydro or, um, hydrogeology which is the study of groundwater is very complicated, very expensive. The state has yet to promulgate regulations regarding that. I don't know if they would. In general, Newcastle is very wet. We have a lot of wetlands. Um, you know, you had asked a question earlier about does every development have this? And that just goes to show you how new this really is because it's really been in, you know, since the, late 90s when this really started to become a management issue for surface water. So, you know, there's many, many developments in Newcastle that pre-exist these regulations and don't have the controls. Yeah, like we, like uh, Sabrina said, the hydrogeological science is very costly, very time consuming, and it's a whole science in itself. Uh, whether DEC wants to take on that responsibility, I don't know. That would be a major undertaking to do uh, and to have everyone do studies whenever they came up with a new project to see how it's going to affect the hydrogeology of the groundwater would be very, very costly. And I'm sure the homeowners would object to spending that much money just to do a simple pool. I can tell you with, with several larger projects, 
um, there is actual monitoring occurring in the, in, you know, we ask them to do something called trace analysis to determine if there are groundwater connections um, in a general sense underneath a construct or in a, in a construction area to surrounding wells. And there's actually been uh, offsite monitoring regarding certain construction sites to make sure that the impacts of the development are not affecting surroundings. Um, you know, so we're trying to put in place protections if we can to try and ensure that existing homes and groundwater wells are not going to be impacted by new development where we can. Well, that, that comes into play if it's a major development and then the planning board and the zoning board and the town board get involved. That's where they have the authority to enact that. Um, I was just speaking of the more building permit aspects of it where there's no authority on that. But once it gets up to the higher level, of course, based on the major impacts from planning aspects, as Sabrina articulated, no doubt you can make them do it. It's very costly, but it could be required if it's needed based on the impacts. Okay, that's helpful to know. I mean, I think that depending on how a homeowner may manage those groundwater problems, it will it can very easily turn into surface water, which makes it not that different from storm runoff. Depending. <laughs> Good point. <laughs> Good point. Are there any other questions? Okay. Thank you, well, guys. Yeah, all this information will be posted on the town's website. It uh, is actually posted already. And there you go. Carrie put it up. Yay. Bob and Sabrina, I just want to say you guys amaze me. As much as uh, some of it I, I follow, I mean, it's not that complicated, but it really is, you know, it's superficial the way you do it here, but it's such an in-depth analysis. And, and thank you very much. Uh, I'm, I'm grateful for all the stuff that you do. Stuff that doesn't sound so great. All the things that you do. <laughs> so thank you very much, both of you. You're thank you so much. All right, everybody yeah, Sabrina, have a wonderful I heard that day. Laugh. That's the laugh for me. There you go. Have a wonderful day and enjoy your weekend, folks. Thank you. Have Thanks a, so much. Enjoy Bye -bye. the weekend. Bye-bye. Bye, -bye. Okay. Bye guys. Bye. So we just have two resolutions. Um, one was uh, actually uh, something that we just needed to uh, tie up from uh, last um, meeting, which was authorization to actually purchase the materials for the lobby alterations at the Chapel Club Performing Arts Center. We went through all those uh, resolutions and we actually um, didn't include this after our discussion. Um, so uh, it's... Uh, everything that we had talked about with a, a cap of not to exceed $18,000. So. May want to make a motion? I could, sure. Um, uh, I, I uh, move to authorize the Department of Public Works to purchase materials for lobby alterations at the Chapel Court Performing Arts Center, including the creation of a ticket booth, a concessionary at a cost not to exceed $18,000. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, I move to authorize the appointment of McCarthy Finger, LLP, uh, Clinton Smith, as council counsel for the planning board at a rate of $255 per hour. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 And am I moving to adjourn? Yes. Uh, yes. <laughs> Uh, I love you guys, though. <laughs> do, do, do you want to stay? I can talk to you about so many things. <laughs> Just call Jill, Jeremy. <laughs> I, 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 I move to adjourn and thank everybody. Uh, uh, thank you. Move to adjourn. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thanks, everyone. Thank, thank you, everybody. Have a great day. Have a great weekend. Thanks, Kimberly. Bye, everybody.